we love you and bless you, Lord. We pray that what I share today, Lord, will be received by the people that you want it to be received by, Lord, by... Amen. In the week, I had a, wrote a list down what I wanted to share, and then I bottled it. I felt that I couldn't do that. So then, I opted for the safe option. You just grab a psalm and preach on that. But, um, and I was, I was in, okay with that. I was like, yeah, that's what I'll do, Lord. I'd already, in, in the things I was going to share, I'd already got the psalm down anyway. And I read it, the psalm 27, and I thought, yeah, it's wonderful. I'm going to look at that. But then this morning I got up. And the Lord said to me, why are you running away? Why are you, why are you, why don't you preach that? What I gave you in the week. Why don't you do that? And so I said to the Lord, I answered him back and said, the thing is, Lord, I'm not at that place. I can't preach that. And the Lord said, yeah. So what? Just because you're not at it, just because you don't know people at it, doesn't mean it's not true. So I had a word with myself, came downstairs, and I got fear coming over me and worried. I can't do that, but I'm bringing it anyway. We have, I think we have to come to an understanding, right, that for the majority of the church, and this is, listen, with all my heart, right, I can't do this any plainer. Andy read a funny thing out the other day. She said, don't be too open-minded that you lose your brain. You know, don't be too open-hearted. Don't, but the problem is, we, we've got an elephant in the room. I'm not talking about my weight problem. The, the problem is we've got a massive issue going on because all of us in the church say things a bit like what Julian shared at the start, that we want to be in this place, but if we confess, we're not at it. But the Word tells us that we can be. And not only that, that's what a child of God is. That's where the position is. Everybody else is faltering. Everyone else is falling away. Everyone else is backslidden. Or they've not listened in their heart what it actually says in the Word of God. Because you can just pick any page, any book. I mean, literally, you could just write pages down of the same thing, what just keeps getting said. And man wants to find a different way. Tell, ask yourself why, for instance, when Jesus comes, they want to kill him. He's God. These are godly people. That's like, that's like a man of God comes in here and you want him to get rid of him. That's what happened with Wesley. That's what happened with every single Christian that stood up, that said, that's not the right way. That's a cultural way. That's a law-based way. That's a, I'm hoping one day the Lord will change me way. Doesn't work like that. Doesn't work like that because you can listen to what Jesus rebukes everybody that says anything remotely like that. Like, teacher, tell us how we can... No, shut up. I'm not a teacher. I'm God. I change you if you want to be changed. And not want it, obey it and do it. I mean, everybody wants to be holy. I mean, you could ask an atheist, would you like to go along and be really good and do everything right? The answer would be yes. They wouldn't attribute that holiness to God, because they don't believe in God, but they'd want that. So everyone alive wants that. Every Christian can say, I want to be where God wants me to be. But God says that that's your issue because he's paved the way and he's done it. So, let's have a look first. I've got about, I'm not, pro oh, I should have looked at my watch. Right, 11.15. <coughs> Romans 12. 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Right. What does it tell us in the Old Testament about a living sacrifice? What did they do? Do they get a lamb and do they just take part of it out and put it on the altar? Or do they take the whole lamb, hooves, tail, innards, hair, brain, everything, heart, and burn it on the altar till it's completely burnt? So that's giving us an indication of what Paul's talking about. He's talking about a whole sacrifice, not a way of living, not I need to hang on to these things, or I need my opinion, or I need this because I need to do whatever. We can list anything. I'm not going to say any things. But what, that's what it's saying. That you give your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's just 101. That's the basic to be a born-again Christian, to be a man of God, to be cleansed from sin and walk a new way and not the old way. That's the basic beginnings. It's not something you attain to after 10 years. It's day one. That is, that is a man who's been speared to the heart, it says in Acts. It means a spear through their heart. They weren't just like, oh, we've heard what you said, what should we do then? They were in, beside themselves in pain. We killed God. We took him, and now we're living our own way. But hey, guess what? We claim that we're Christians, or whatever they said they were then. Abraham's seed. So you, it's wholly acceptable unto God. Now you know when they did this offering what that animal was. It's the finest, it's the perfect, it's the unblemished animal. The one that's giving everything, not just an idea of following God. Your whole life. This might sound harsh to some of the younger people, but if you start on the right path, it can stop you from doing what I've done for 14 years and still crying out to God, I want to be born again, Lord. I want to be a new man. I'm, I'm sick of arguing and having opinions. I don't want that anymore. I want to be a holy man. I believe in your word, Lord. I believe what it says in this piece of scripture. I believe it. But God says believing it's not enough. Belief has got to have feet. It's got to have obeying. It's got to have commitment. It's got to have loyalty and, and, and an action behind it. You cannot just say, I believe in God. I know hundreds of people, no one in this church, that say they believe in God. It doesn't mean anything. It has to have action, like James says. Faith with nothing is just a waste of time. What are you doing? We need to be born again. We need to be new creations, different. Not carrying stuff around and still struggling through it in our own understanding. Oh, Lord, help me today to be better. No, today I will be, Lord. Today I'm going to obey. I'm going to be a man of God. And keep saying that until it's fulfilled in your life. That's what Paul's saying about till you attain it. Keep going. But don't, don't live the wrong way whilst you're doing it. Commit your whole life to God. Do you know what? It sounds radical, doesn't it? Because it is. That's why they killed Jesus. That's why they wanted to get rid of him. Because he's opposed to everything that they were saying. There wasn't one thing that they agreed with. Only the man of God agreed with him. Only people that could obey him and listen to him and do what he said. He even said to his own disciples, you're going to turn back, implying that hundreds already had. They were following the way. Oh, no, man. whoa, wait, wait there. That's, that's way too hot. No, 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 not doing that. They turned back. And, and be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's saying that when you give your whole life as a sacrifice, you will prove that God exists. 
because he has transformed your life. The perfect will of God will be walked out in your days. It says that you've got the light of God and you walk in that way. It means you've gone from all of the world to all of the light. You don't, it's not a head torch. It's a whole light lit and way in God. Every day, all the time, you don't want anything else. You, he's your all in all. So, Luke eleven thirteen. So, I think I said something a little bit on this last time. All the things that's in the New Testament in Jesus is talking about a father and son relationship. It's talking about the perfect loving father and the perfect obedient son. The one that only does what the father says. He never ever answers back. He never ever thinks, oh no, don't, I don't have to do that. No. Everything. Not one thing. Not 99%. Not 99.9. Every single thing he does only what the father says. That's the relationship. And that's what he's talking about. Asking for things and you're receiving See, if we go around thinking that God's going to do something or help us, we're missing the point. Because we ask him for it and just say, I want to be a holy man of God. I don't want to live like this. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be a cultural church. I don't want to be just like everybody else. I want to be different, Lord. I want to be marked out like they did in the Old Testament. The slaves got their ears cut so you could see which family they were in. They got circumcised so they could see which family they're in. But we don't have that anymore. So how would they know that we're men of God and women of God? By the way we walk. Because we don't go with anybody else. We go our own way. Even against the church. Even against society. Against everything. Even against the government. It doesn't mean you don't listen to what the government say. But in your mind you live for God. And you obey the law. That doesn't mean you agree with it. It doesn't mean you follow everything it says, that's not the same. You obey God and keep the law. It's, a, it's easy. Listen to the bit at the end, at 13, 11, 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now tell me something, when you got baptised, did you ask for the Holy Spirit? Did you ask to be filled with it? Well you don't, do you? You just give your life to God and the Spirit comes in. But this is a different thing. This is being filled to overflowing. This is having the living waters come up in you. You've got the Spirit in you, hence why you're here. Hence why you're a Christian. But to walk the godly path, you need the full anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it in your own strength. You can't say, I'm a Christian, I'm doing it, I'm trying to do it. No. The things in the Bible are showed as images. The man who's possessed by a devil, we need to be possessed by God. You, you're thinking, that sounds brainwashing. Of course it is. You're a man full of sin. Tell me how you're going to get over it. They, they've been doing it for years. There's no results. Churches that don't follow God, that don't run after the Holy Spirit and are filled with the Holy Spirit, they collapse and fall. Even if they've got 30,000 people. That doesn't make a jot of difference. If you had 30,000 people in an area all filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, but you've got Eden. You've got something unbelievable. That would be an amazing town to live in. And any born-again Christian would move there instantly if the power of God, like in revivals, came on people like that. So numbers doesn't mean anything. We only need one person. We only need one. You only need one or two that walk the right way. It's so obvious if you're walking in God and you're born again and you're full of the fire and the Holy Spirit. How's it not obvious? I'll show you that it's obvious. Let's look. Hello. First, we'll look at Luke 24. Look. In Luke 24. 
I tell you what, I'm praising God I listened to him, you know. I was about to bottle it. I was about to go, no, Lord. I'll just... You see, it's hard. It's hard to accept God and listen to him. It goes against your nature. You're thinking, look, I don't need to preach the word of God. I don't need to bring the correct thing. I'll just bring the word of God. I'll just read what it says, Lord. I'll not answer it. I'll just do it. It's easy. I can do that. So tell me why I'm not doing that and why I'm listening to the Lord. Because it's important that we understand these things. So important to go the right way, to listen. Right. In, in 49, it says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry, in other words, wait. Wait ye in the city of Jerusalem until you're enduded, or enduded, I can't say the word very well, with the power from on high. Well, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? He's talking about, in Joel, it said, and it came and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And it means, the word endued means to provide with a quality or a trait to put on as being clothed with God's enablement. Enablement to walk a holy life. All of scripture is always talking about if you're struggling, don't struggle, don't have burden. It's talking about living holy. The whole, the whole of the Bible from the beginning to the end is all about God's people trying to live holy. And now Adam and Eve just fail instantly and get kicked out. And you think it's harsh. It's harsh. All they did was eat some fruit. How harsh is that? But they chose the different way. And if you don't choose the right way, that's the same result. How's God going to be so harsh with Adam and Eve, but be just gentle with you? Oh, well, we don't have to, we don't have to give it all. We don't have to give our whole lives. We can, that's okay. God's a graceful God. He's a loving God. Of course he is. But he tells us in Scripture that we're to walk holy. And he's already told us there's no holiness in us. He's told us that our best works are filthy rags. So he's already qualified what he's talking about. He's not making some stuff up. When he says walk holy, he's saying because he knows you can't do it, and he's never met a man that could, because if Adam and Eve couldn't live holy and walk holy, then how on earth does anyone else do it? I mean, I mean monks go and live in monasteries to make their life easier so they don't see women, so they don't have any internet, so they don't have any issue going on. They do it deliberately because they can't live holy. So I'll go and live there and it's much easier. But God never told us to do that. He never told us to go and live on his own somewhere, on some remote island where we're never challenged. He's told us to live holy in this world, like we're living in heaven. So that's the problem. How do you do that? You do it by waiting on the Lord to fill you with the Holy Spirit. But you don't wait and carry on your life. You prepare the way. Like John the Baptist said, how do you prepare the way? Give it up. Stop doing it. If you go to something or you do something and you're sitting there like watching telly and you think, I could be praying now, I could be reading the word. Get up, turn the TV off, don't turn it on again. There's your answer. That'll never be an issue if you don't turn it on. What about other things in your life? When I used to swear all the time, what's the answer? Stop swearing. Garrett, stop swearing. Trust in the Lord and stop swearing. What if you look at girls or whatever and you think things, what do you do? Say no. Say no. It, why is it a temptation? You haven't sinned. It's only if you follow it out. Satan is here to tempt you all the time. You're here to say no. I walk a different way. I follow a different thing. That's what I do. And in that, God will enter in. God will enter in. Right. Acts 2. Acts 2.4. Probably won't get through all this, but I'm going to have a reasonable go at it. Acts 2.4. The problem is for me, I talk too much. Let's just let scripture do its job. And I trust in God that it will convict your hearts and mine at the same time. I shared with you at the start, I'm not at this position. 
but I'm starting to do it this morning by obeying what he told me to do. That's one of the first things I've ever done to today. I usually plan it all in my head, what I'm going to say, and write down weeks before, and then I go with it. But Lord is, is making me obey. Yes, Lord. So look, in Acts 2, in Acts 2, 2, 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Oh, wow. They... Man, we read this like it's supernatural, weird, like sci-fi film. All the fire came down and come out their ears and their head and everything, and it was amazing. And this is what God's talking about for his people. It's not just for those. Otherwise, you might as well dismiss most of the Bible. So when God talks to Moses, is that not to us? Oh, no, he's just talking to Moses. And when he tells them to take off the shoes because it's holy ground, oh, we don't have to do that. We could just walk around with muck on his feet. It doesn't make any sense. You can't. You've got to read it and apply it to your life. If God wanted to fill those 120 men of God with his Holy Spirit, then, then it would say later on that we don't need to do that. Oh no, that was for them because they're instructing the church. But something miraculous happens when they're filled with that Holy Spirit. If you read before that time, the disciples and the people of that time were moaning, complaining, grumbling. Oh, Lord, send the fire down. Oh, we don't need to talk to them. Let's go this way. They're telling him Peter, telling Jesus what it's not going to happen. They're completely different men. Then when they get filled with God, look how they change. If you don't believe me, look at what Stephen's like. If you read what Stephen's like and then read what Jesus is like on the cross, can you tell the difference? Stephen is a man of God, filled with fire, filled with the Holy Spirit, like all men of God need to be, and women. It's not for, just for Stephen. Stephen's getting stoned to death, and he says, don't judge him, Lord. That's what Stephen says. Well, I tell you now, if someone came in here to stone me now, that is never going to come out of my mouth, not unless I'm filled with God. It ain't coming out of my fleshly mouth. I tell you what I did, I did what I used to do in Loughborough when I got in trouble, run fast. And they can throw stones at me as I run off. I'm not going to kneel down and get stoned to death like Stephen does. No way. In fact, one of the times in Loughborough, I picked a bin up and threw it at somebody and then ran. That's the better option for a fleshly man. But Stephen is a man of God. So he just drops to his knees and they stone him to death. And he pours out his heart in love. That is a man of God. It ain't a fleshly man trying to live a reasonably good, godly life. It's a converted, changed man of God. And he's not in the Bible to show us that we should worship Stephen. We don't worship Stephen. We worship the power that's in him that can come into us. Well, that's what we worship. We don't even talk about Stephen. Man, we should do, shouldn't we? But we don't. Why? Because we know it's not Stephen. We know he didn't pick that way to be that way, but God changed his life when he obeyed. There's a difference. And if we're talking about being born again and in love with God, look at verse 12, and they were all amazed. So when God comes into your life, people around you will be amazed. You won't have to say to them, I go to church. It's going to be like, wow. You're, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I come? Exactly. Exactly. That's how powerful it is. So look, then look at Acts 5.32, and this is the cruncher. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God have given to them that obey him. Now, when you got baptised... Correct me if I'm wrong, did you obey God in everything you did? Well, I didn't. So that's why I wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. Didn't say the Spirit didn't come in me. Didn't say God didn't come inside me at that birth, the seed, the tiny thing. But it didn't fill me. But it tells you here that the Holy Ghost is given to those that obey him. Now, I know what you're thinking. No one can do it like that. 
But that's the thing that keeps coming into my heart and my mind. No one can do it. I can talk about Peter. He told me the other week that five years ago, he's been dying to self and he's still not done it. So it's not easy. No one said it's easy. But the problem is, if you fight at it, you'll never attain it. You've got to believe it and obey it and got to just do it. It's about doing it, like James says. It's the change of thinking you can be it or act like it or work at it or wait for a day when God has mercy on you and fills you with it or you can obey the scriptures. If the scriptures say you need to give your whole life, that's what you need to do. If you hold back, then it doesn't happen. We talked about the young ruler the other week. He asks, how can I be made perfect? Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go away and sell everything and then follow me. All of the disciples stop doing what they're doing. I mean, why? Why? I mean, he's just a fisherman. What's he doing wrong? But they just die to everything and follow Christ. It's a picture. Moses, Abraham, all of them walk away from their worlds and go to a different lands because they take them out of Egypt to bring them into God's land, to bring them into a new way. The whole point is, when you get into that land, do not go back. Do not build Egypt in Cana. Don't. Change your life. Change your heart. Do everything differently. Repent. Turn around. Change it. Go. Stop. Leave it all behind and go after God. Proverbs 8. In Proverbs 8, so Proverbs 8, 32 says, Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children. Real people of God are his children. They've got this family book that's got all their forefathers in it, the people that are in the way, the people that follow God, the people that loved him, the people that prove that God is real because they turned away from everything and they didn't forsake God and he never forsook them. For blessed are they that keep my ways, hear instructions and be wise and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my posts of my doors. For whoso findeth me, findeth life, and shall obtain favour from the Lord. Whilst we're waiting, we're to glorify God. This is the, this is, I didn't even know. I mean, I'm not going to get you to put your hands up, but I didn't know what glorifying God meant. I had to look it up the other day. I didn't know what it meant. Well, I've heard people say, we glorify his name. What does it mean? So it means that you're magnifying God. You're lifting him up. And how do you do that? By the life you live, you shine a light on God. So in other words, you live holy. You don't do what the world does. You don't get caught sneaking things in the world doing things you shouldn't do, you live godly lives. And when you live godly lives and glorify the Lord, the Spirit enters in. Hence why Jesus says, the Spirit's not come yet because I'm not glorified. When we glorify God, He will enter in. He will fill you up. He will take your hand. And you will know Him personally. You'll know Him so well, He'll be your father. He'll be your daddy. He will be the be-all and end-all and everything in between. That's what he'll be. And that's our command, what we're told to do in the Bible, to glorify the Lord, to lift him up. And you do it by stopping other things that don't glorify him. And you think, I, can't, I just can't do it. But the point is, it is a process. It's a belief in God and a process at the same time. Because as you start to drop things... God enters in in that area and he glory. Like, hence why some people can come to church and they can be having tears and they can be praising the Lord, but then they can be doing something else on a Monday morning or on a Sunday afternoon because 
in this area, they've glorified God. So God's had, a, had his way with them in that bit. But we want to be filled. We don't just want a little bit. We don't just want our toe to glorify God or the soles of our shoes when we're kneeling down in prayer. We want to be filled. And if you do want to be filled, that's what we have to do. There is no other way of doing it. You can't just want to be filled. Hence the young ruler wanted to be perfect. He said, I've done everything. But God says, well, no, you've got to do that. He couldn't do it. He didn't want it that much. You've got to want it and keep running after it. And God will give it. Hence why if you'd have asked me two years ago, I wouldn't have shared this message or even two weeks ago. Because I wasn't asking for it. I didn't even know what glorifying God was. We've got to change our ways we live and live for the glory of God. And then he will enter in. Think about it. When you go for an MOT on your car, you can't have the ticket till you've obeyed. You can't. It don't matter if you want 12 months and you don't want a massive bill. It's not happening. You can't have that certificate. You can't have the Holy Spirit until you let him in. And you let him in by obeying what God says. There is no other way of doing it. You can try all you like. I can try all I like. I've done everything. Apart from lie on glass and nails, which they did years ago, to try and repent and feel so sorry for their sin. You can't do it. But God's no more entered into me and filled me up now as he had two years ago. He hasn't, because if he had, I'd know. I'd be amazed. Trust me. I know what I'm like. If God had really entered into me and he filled me right up, I would know. I'm telling you, my wife would know. In fact, my wife, she gets so sick of me for preaching at her. You know the day I get filled with the Holy Spirit, she'll be standing up here and testifying. Because gone will be the flesh, gone will be the argument, gone will be the whinging on, and me and her fighting. That'll be gone. Because Jesus didn't do that. He was meek, mild, gentle, loving, caring, and everything that you know. That's the man of God. That's a man of God. And that man of God can do anything. Everyone that ever got filled with the Holy Spirit can do anything. They go through the land, they get shouted at, kicked, sworn at, shipwrecked, beaten, locked up. Bunyan got put in jail and left his blind daughter as a baby with his wife with no money because he said, I've got to preach the word of God. And they said, right, you're going to jail. And they asked him again. I've read the transcript of the report in the police station. And they said to him again, why don't you just renounce it and go back to the normal way and do what the Church of England want you to do? No. Oh, preach the word of God faithfully. Right, you're going to jail then. So he'd made laces for 12 years while his daughter got brought up struggling. That's a a man of God. That's a man of God with one way, only one way, and only that way, and no other way. And that's what God does to those that trust and obey him. I'll end with this. There's a song that we sing in the home. I'm not going to sing it to you, don't worry. You can cut the mic. Praise the Lord, yeah. At least I might get the lyrics right, though. Not guaranteed, though. Look. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who trust and obey. Trust and obey, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear can abide while we trust and obey. I won't keep singing the chorus. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. But we can never prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favour he bestows and the joy, sorry, for the favour he shows and the joy he bestows are for all those that trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side 
in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Notice how there's qualification there all the time. For those that obey, God enters in. We even sing about it all the time. Jesus says, as in, in John it says, those that keep my commandments, we will come and live in him. But he can't, if it was the other way around, if it was for anyone that goes to church and believes in God, we'll come and live in him and then they'll keep my commandments. It'd be that way around. Jesus is like mega pedantic. If he puts it in a sentence, it's in a way, deliberately, so we can't mistake it. Remember we're children, it's written so anyone can understand it. You can't read it a different way. If, the, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and we will come and live in him. It's, it, you can't change it. I, I want to. I want to have it. If you'll come and live in me, Lord, I'll keep all your commandments. That's my version. That'd be great. Well, you could just change it around. It's only grammar. But it doesn't say that. It says, when we obey, God will enter in. And the last thing I'll leave you with, we can't say we believe. We can't say we believe and one day it'll happen. To really believe means you obey it now, this morning, today. Today is the day of salvation. God, his kingdom is close at hand. It means now. It doesn't mean in 10 years when I've finished my job and I've got time on my hands and then I'll obey, Lord. Then I'll have more money. I'll have, I'll have no mortgage in a few years. Then I'll go and give lots of money. No, it doesn't say that. It says now. Now obey the word of God. Now come after me. Now follow in my footsteps. But we have to have faith. All of this is circular, isn't it? It goes round and round and round. I made a note the other day that in Peter, in, in 1 Peter and in John, it says, how, does, how did God walk? It says that we need to follow him in his steps. It says that we need to follow him in his steps, right? It says we need to follow him. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving as an example that ye should follow in his steps. The same thing's repeated in 2 John. How did Jesus walk when he was on this earth? Having faith in his Father for, for the glory that was before him, even though everything came against him, but for the glory that was before him. And what was that glory? Doing his Father's will. And that's what he calls us to do. His Father's will and that's our glory, that's our joy, that's our beauty. But not in the flesh. It's not beauty in the flesh. It's a pain in the butt. It means getting up early on a Sunday. It means going to prayer meetings. It means cleaning stuff. It means doing stuff. It's horrible. None of you want to do it. Don't even pretend you do. That's like, oh, look at me, I'm so righteous. I love doing everything for God. No, that doesn't exist. But when he's entered in, then it's your joy. It's not in before. It's burden it's struggling that's why jesus says if you're struggling come to me don't carry it come to me didn't say stop doing it don't carry it come to me and i'll make it light hence when his spirit enters in and fills you it will be light it will be like that song just said nothing will be in the way i know i've got to finish lord we thank you for today thank you lord that i got mostly through it lord Bless you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for teaching us and keeping us, Lord. Thank you for being patient with us, Lord. Where we suffer with having no patience, Lord, you are there waiting for us. Lord, change our lives, Lord. Help us to see and obey your word and trust in you and have faith in your word and your Holy Spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.